we are at the top of the hour, so let's kick this off and get it started here. Um, welcome to the uh, Excel edition of the Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel User Group Meetup. This is the April 2022 edition, and I'm uh, super happy to have uh, Mark Proctor here. He's going to be talking a little bit about VBA, and it's been far too long since we've been talking about VBA on this, uh, this channel, so some good stuff coming up here. Uh, before we get started, though, let me just run through and uh, and do our, our sort of normal um, – hey, look at that. I've got a, a different topic. Actually, Mark, I'm going to need you to change out. You're going to be doing self-joins right now. No? <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> uh, you're on mute. You can't actually protest while you're on mute, Mark. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> Not a big deal. Um, we'll we'll get that one fixed. But uh, but yeah. So um, so we'll be doing some VBA in just a little bit here. Uh, I want to throw out a big uh, thanks to the sponsor Skillwave for hosting this uh, this program and uh, and finding our speakers and getting everybody here and and whatnot. Um, a huge uh, huge thanks to them. Uh, Excel Guru, of course, is my company, uh, parent company of Skillwave as well, um, which uh, also provides the uh, Monkey Tools add-in, which can help you build uh, better business intelligence models faster with Power Query and uh, Power Pivot and also um, connect to and look at your Power BI models. Uh, our next meetups coming up, um, we have in our Power BI track on April 21st, we've got Ed Hansbury is going to be coming back and he is going to be talking about Power BI and Power Automate or Flow, Carlos, if you prefer. Um, so uh, Ed's going to be showing us how to increase our productivity with that. Should be a really, really interesting session. Um, I can't wait to see what he brings to that one. Uh, for the Excel track, You'll notice on this one here that I have not got the start time locked down exactly on this. There's a couple of question marks around when we're going to start. And the reason for this is because I'm actually working right now with our speaker on this one to try and figure out exactly what time we're going to start this one off and also get confirmation on the session. I am hoping to get someone from Microsoft to come and speak specifically about Mac Excel because it's been a long time that we've actually, uh, since we've had that on the, uh, the platform here, uh, but we are still working on those details and getting it locked down. So that's the intention. Uh, should it change? Well, there's going to be something really cool and by somebody really awesome. So keep, uh, keep tuned when we announce uh, what's going to be happening there. Uh, remember that we do have our Monkey Shorts videos on SkillWave. These are uh, less than three minutes of material, technical material from end to end, being released on a weekly basis. Uh, tomorrow's episode is going to be coming out, well, tomorrow morning. Um, so uh, all kinds of good stuff there. I think we're up to episode 12 now. Um, so if you haven't checked those out, you should definitely do it. The, uh, the link here I will throw into the chat in a little bit. Uh, that will get you right to the playlist where you can actually get notified on a weekly basis as they come out every Thursday morning. Uh, I have a task. Oh, sorry. Let's uh, just go and mute that one down. There we go. Um, so I just uh, a reminder for folks, uh, my next semester of the self-service business intelligence boot camp that I run, a, uh, an intensive program where we talk about Excel and Power Query and Power Pivot and Power BI and how to use all these things together, how to clean up and model your data properly. Uh, the next semester starts on April 19th. Uh, this is a coached course with video components and Ask Me Anything sessions uh, that runs for, uh, well, the actual schedule is about a six-week program, but we have uh, um, monthly Ask Me Anything sessions for an entire year included with your subscription. Uh, if you're interested in coming and learning how to, to uh, do Excel and Power BI better, come and check out this program here. Uh, also, if this is maybe not your thing, maybe you're not ready to go into uh, deep uh, analytics with your stuff, we also have a fundamentals boot camp. Uh, probably not targeted at you necessarily, but if you're trying to get everybody in your organization up to a core level of Excel skills, you should definitely check this one out. Uh, we've got a couple of big organizations right now that are just trying to get everybody to level where you know they're using pivot tables, they're using a little bit of Power Query to get things done and changing their workflows to make life easier. If that sounds like something that might be of interest to you and your team, you can definitely check out the link down at the bottom as well. Our next semester of this one, again, a coach program, starts on May 17th. Uh, just a reminder, the home for uh, Van Pug. YT for YouTube. That will get you right onto our channel there. The last thing that I'm going to throw out here, as I always do, is uh, throw out a note that if you are interested in speaking at Vanpug, we would love to have you. You can fill out this little survey here, and we'll get you on our platform. I'm actually working with somebody, uh, connecting with her next week, just to sort of chat about what's going on. And we're going to be having a new speaker coming up in 
uh, no, it's next month, May, June, uh, June's program as well. So I'm uh, always looking forward for new speakers. If you've got cool things that you're doing with, uh, with Excel or with Power BI, uh, definitely let us know. We'd love to have you come and actually present to our group. And on that note, that's what I have for right now. So um, what I'm going to do, uh, Mark, I'm going to let you go and take over the screen here and, uh, and get started with, uh, with some VBA material for us, if, if you don't feel doing Power Query is, is your thing. Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> we will be talking <laughs> briefly about Power Query, but there you go. We uh, get a vote. Uh, I don't think you want to uh, to request control of my screen. That one's not going to. No, work. I do not. Let's, no, let's, let's share my screen. <laughs> there we go. Right. Um, okay. Right. Let me just sort out my windows here to get everything in the right place. Okay. Right. Let me close that. And minimize that. And now I will share my screen. So can you all see my screen, hopefully? I can see your screen. That's fantastic. Um, and I'll just let people know that as per usual, uh, Mark and I have chatted and I will be moderating the chat. So if you got questions, fire them in there. Um, and I may answer some, and then I'll, uh, I'll interrupt uh, Mark at, at an opportune time. If I can figure out when that'll be uh, to ask questions as we, uh, as we go along is what we decided, right, Mark? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. All you, man. Right. So uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me, Ken. It's great to be here. Um, and in the invitation, Ken said, I said, what, what do you want to be about? And Ken said, you can talk about anything as long as you're, it's something that excites you about Excel or Power BI or Power Query. Well, <clears throat> VBA is, while it appears to be getting a bad rap, what I'm about to show you, I think, is quite exciting. So hopefully you'll agree. Uh, and, we're and we're looking at, or the topic is, how can we automate the last 20%? And as we go through, hopefully I'll demonstrate what that is, but also explain my approach to how to do that uh, as if, as easily as possible. Uh, before that, just a few things about me. Uh, so I'm a father, I've got three girls, uh, I've got one wife, uh, that's probably about the right number um, of wives I suspect. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant by uh, training and then in I think it was October last year I set up my own uh, reporting automation consultancy which is called 27 Solutions. Uh, my main home is over at Excel off the grid and also have a YouTube channel uh, which is updated. Uh, I try to release new content on there every week. I do have a training program which is called the Automation Academy and a lot of what we will be looking at today is content from that but I'm hoping this is not a sales pitch but is something that is useful and educational uh, that you can apply uh, into your own work. So uh, let's start. So there's a book by Gary Keller, it's called The One Thing. And he says in that book, the key question that you should be asking is what's the one thing that you can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. So in terms of Excel or any work at all, this is a key question. So what's the one thing that we can do in Excel such that by doing it makes everything else easier or unnecessary? Now, a lot of people rely on shortcuts. A lot of people love shortcuts. The truth is I know about 10 shortcuts. I might be able to stretch to 15 because my focus has never been on shortcuts. It's always been on automation because my view is why am I trying to do something faster if I don't even need to do it to start with? So rather than being faster at doing something, let's try and automate that thing. Now, I think when we think about Excel as a reporting tool, what we actually have is um, a six step process. So we start our process with input. Every reporting process starts with input. We then reshape that input into data. We use that data to calculate. And from those calculations, we present either in dashboards or through PowerPoint, and then we distribute those, um, those presentations. Now, uh, in terms of, and I'm a finance person, so I'm going to use finance examples here. So this kind of framework holds true for uh, lots of different areas. And when we think about reporting automation in Excel, 
often when you think about reporting, you're thinking dashboards and, and other um, kind of analytical tools. But actually, you know, there are there's lots of different reporting that we get inside Excel. So, for example, if we are preparing a budget deck for our CFO to present to the board, then that takes input. We reshape that input into data, which we calculate on, we present, and then we distribute that in some PowerPoint presentation that he then um, just uh, presents to the board. But equally, if you are an accountant or a management accountant, you have to pay a cost center pack for your cost center owners in your, uh, in your organization. You're going to take inputs, you're going to reshape them into data, you're going to calculate, present and distribute. Also, if you happen to work in credit control and you have to send out month end statements to your customers using Excel, you're going to take that input, you're going to reshape it into data, which you're going to calculate, present and distribute on. So this framework holds true for so much of the reporting that we do inside Excel. Now, in the old days and what people used to do is go straight from input, they would copy and paste that input and then try and calculate on it. They'd skip out on that reshape and data point, uh, which are actually key to how we can report efficiently in Excel. I mean, hopefully uh, this being the Vancouver Power BI and Excel or modern Excel meetup group, hopefully that is uh, a fundamental point that most of you understand. Now, in terms of Excel, so when we think about this entire process, we have uh, so inputs, we need to control our inputs, we need to have uh, naming conventions, and there's various VBA and templates that we can do to make sure that we manage uh, our files and our inputs. So for example, if we're downloading from an ERP system, or if we're getting data uh, in different sheets, CSV files, et cetera, that we can manage those. We then use Power Query as that tool to reshape the data. We then hold that into tables or the data model, which we then calculate on using formulas, pivot tables, and DAX. Uh, which we can then create dashboards with. And finally, we might then use PowerPoint or Word uh, or other applications to present that in a complete package before we distribute it. Now, that's the desktop model that we follow. In the online world, things are slightly trickier because the tools that we have are not the same. So while we still have tables and we have formulas and pivot tables, this Office Scripts and Excel Online piece is kind of there as to how we automate Excel. And rather than VBA, we have this PowerPoint element uh, either side to manage this input and reshaping piece uh, and also a bit of the present and distribute piece of this entire process. And that's what we have when we think about online. Now, this is a, an image from Microsoft, and it's trying to uh, express to us uh, how all of this kind of fits together, like the equivalent technologies that we have. So from an end user approachable perspective, we have VBA for the desktop, or we have Office Scripts for the web. And then we have the more uh, developer audiences at the bottom with their comment, com add-ins and uh, Office JS add-ins. The problem with this view, and hopefully Microsoft won't um, kick me out of the program when I show this next slide, is the fact that Office Scripts is not as powerful as VBA. Yeah, what Office Scripts can do is a very much a reduced set of what VBA can do. Not just that, but there are holes, there are gaps uh, in what Office Scripts can do compared to what VBA can do. So for example, if I want to open up another workbook and copy and paste a worksheet, well, I can't do that at all with Office Scripts. Something that should be, you'd think, quite simple, that can't be achieved with Office Scripts at all. So there's gaps there with Office Scripts. Equally, from what I've seen from the Office JS platform, there's also gaps there. But when we come back to our desktop view, there's really gaps about what we can do with our desktop view because we're on a different platform and a different uh, technology. So there's gaps between all these different platforms and or languages that we can use to automate Excel. Now, let's just think for a second about this real difference between VBA and Office Scripts. So when we think about VBA, we've got this, what I call the micro level. This is where we have the application inside Excel. That's where uh, we tend to use VBA. But from Excel, using VBA, we can automate PowerPoint, we can automate Word, we can automate Access, we can automate Outlook. And we do this by binding to external applications. We can even 
uh, automate uh, Adobe Acrobat. We can use Windows API calls. So there's so much power there in VBA. And when we come to Office Scripts, well, Office Scripts are bound by the Excel workbook. We can only work in the single workbook that we currently have open. So if we have a workbook in a browser, that is as much scope as we get. But what we can use is the Power Automate piece to then have that environment level automation. So we have, um, so just like VBA has the ability to bind to external applications, Power Automate has connectors into external applications. And one of those connectors it has is into Excel and into Office Scripts. So when we think about this overall automation piece, we have VBA that is a, um, although it's meant to be a kind of a, an end user uh, solution, it's definitely not in that developer section. It has a lot of power. When we come to online, we have Power Automate and Office Scripts, and we have to kind of use those together to even get close to the same level of power that we would want from VBA. Now, if we think about Power Automate for a second, and this is quite a useful um, way of thinking about things, because, so what can Power Automate do by itself? Well, ultimately, Power Automate doesn't have that many connectors or actions that it can do with, uh, with Excel. So it's primarily around managing data. It can get tables, it can create tables, it can update a row, it can delete rows. It's all about tables. Then there's a few connectors that are related to worksheets. The only other connector is left is the run script connector. So effectively, we have this, uh, this broad brush approach about managing data with inside Power Automate, but anything that's that we really want to do inside Excel that isn't using Excel as some kind of database, because that's really what these other connectors are trying to do. They're just trying to use Excel as a way of holding data. For everything else we want to do in Excel, we have to use Office Scripts. So in this kind of Power Automate and Office Scripts uh, world, are they ready and are they capable and are they good enough for us to use to automate our work? Well, I think there are some key fundamental things that are missing. First of all, there is the lack of Power Query uh, within Excel online. Now, at the start, and we'll see, we'll see in a second, is that why Power Query is so important for that whole reporting automation piece. As I said, also on, uh, even in Power Automate and Office Scripts, it's not possible to move worksheets between workbooks. We can move data, but actually moving a worksheet is not possible. Uh, or if it is possible, it's an exceptionally technical way that I haven't come across yet. There's no support for updating linked PowerPoint or Word documents. So if we are, if we have that that PowerPoint presentation that your uh, that your CFO is going to present to the board, well, the only way we can update anything within that PowerPoint presentation is if we copy individual slides and charts into that PowerPoint presentation. Also, if we want to manipulate data, we actually need a high level of expertise. And this partly links back to this Power Query point that when we use Power Query, we have this user interface that we can easily manipulate our data and get it into a state that we can use. But without that, we need a high level of expertise dealing with a lot of loops and arrays to reshape our data into something useful. And also in terms of this Power Automate and Office Scripts piece, it's only available at present. Um, I mean, Office Scripts is kind of coming to um, the desktop. There is some um, there's some features released at the back end of last year, I think it was, uh, that should start bringing Office Scripts into the desktop. But at the minute, it's only available for Excel Online. And most of us, I suspect, are working in this kind of hybrid world of online, but also local servers, because you know, we store a lot of things on OneDrive, but when it comes to work that actually needs to be uh, done between a team, most of that, I suspect, is still saved on, I said, local servers or even servers that are in the cloud, but they are still treated as servers rather than a true online experience. 
So are Power Automate and Office Scripts ready for really automating Excel? I think the answer is no, not yet. I said the biggest issue is around Power Querying, because if we went back, if you go back 10 years, if you go back 15 years, the way that we carried out most of our automation was through VBA. And Power Query, I'm guessing here, took about 80% of that VBA code that we needed to write, and that is now exists, or the things that we can do are now covered by Power Query. And just an example as to why we love Power Query so much is that, um, I think it was uh, Gil Raviv, I think it's um, on his site, he'd had a, a survey at the end of 2020, so that Power Query users estimate they save from 22 to 89 working days per year, that with an average across all the people who responded of 76 days. So that's 30% of somebody's working time is saved through Power Query from the people who responded to that survey. So the question really comes back, well, what about the other 20%? Yeah, you know, we know that um, we hold our data in tables, we're in the data model, and we have formulas and pivot tables and DAX that kind of operate automatically, but then we waste a lot of time in terms of that automation piece in this other 20%. That is where we waste time with updating PowerPoint slides. That's where we waste time with creating PDFs that we can send out to customers. You know, these, this is where this other 20% of our automation time is spent. But let's not throw out Power Automate quite yet, because I want us to think about the approach that Power Automate uses. Now, if you've never used it, that is perfectly fine. Here is a, uh, a flow that I uh, had created that was used for the a presentation I did to the Toronto Meetup Group. And you can see that in this flow, there are various steps that we go through. So when a new email arrives, this might be a bit small on your screen, but when a new email arrives, uh, we get those attachments from that, we create a file, we then run a couple of scripts, uh, we get the file contents from that, and then we send an email. So just to expand on that, we can see that we have various steps. And I've expanded the run script step here. And you can see the run script is a specific action, uh, and it's worth saying that each of these steps does expand uh, to have parameters. And each of these parameters are effectively just text items that we have there. So what's the location, OneDrive for business, document library, where's the file saved, and what script do we want to run on that file? Now, this is interesting because if we think about Power Automate as an application, And we head back to the late 60s, early 70s, uh, when the Unix uh, platform was being developed. And they had what's known as the, the Unix philosophy. And this is summarized down to effectively three points. That we need to write programs that do one thing and do it well. We need to write programs that work together. And we need to write programs that handle text streams because that is a universal interface. So just remember those three items. Write programs that do one thing and do it well, that work together, and that handle text streams. So when we come to Power Automate, we can see this framework up in place. So we have this create file step. Now, the only thing the create file step does is create a file. So it does one thing, it does it well, it works with the, the rest of Power Automate. And if I had have expanded that step, you'd see that it primarily takes text streams as its input. There are a few other elements in there uh, with modern computing, but in principle, that's kind of how Power Automate operates. So for Power Automate, we have this kind of master automation process, and then we have this modular, um, these modular actions that we take these actions one by one. So if, if we think about that, we have this master process, which is what we're trying to achieve to get our final result. So from an Excel workbook perspective, Let's say that we had several actions. Maybe our first action is to copy a workbook, then open that workbook, change a cell value, save the workbook, and close a workbook. These are each action steps that we might want to undertake as part of a larger master process. And the best thing about this is that if we have a master process that does this, well, we can change that into another master process 
so we can get a larger working framework. Right, I'm about to move on to an example to show you how this could work in an Excel context. But before I get there, are there any questions that anyone's had? There's nothing in the chat at this point yet, Mark, so I would say you're probably good to go on. Although so, I got one question. Um, did you ever work with Unix? Because I'm thinking that you don't look nearly old enough for that. Uh, I have never worked with Unix, no. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Me either. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even alive in the late 60s or early 70s. So, um, Right, so let's, let's move across to this, um, to how we might think about this framework inside Excel. Right, I've got my notes here on the left, hopefully, so if I, that should prevent me from making some errors at least. So let's start here. Okay, let's say I want an action step, and that action step uh, that we have uh, is, let me just insert a module. So the action step that we want to check, that we, that we want to take, let's say that that is that we want to update a cell value. So the action step might be, uh, sub change cell value. And the parameters that we would need to pass into that step are well, you know, what's the what's the worksheet called? So WS name, that's a string. Get a bit more space over here. Uh, so what worksheet are we going to change? What cell range are we going to change? So range, dress, uh, string. And then what value are we going to make it? So new value as string. From that, we could just use a single line of code, which would be sheets, WS name, range, S, dot value equals new value. So in terms of thinking about this as a uh, as an overall process, we now have this single step, which if we wanted to we call the sub uh, run automation, and all we would do is do run change cell value. Uh, our worksheet name we've got open is sheet one. Let's say we wanted to put this into cell uh, G1. And the value we want is hello. So if we now run that, as you can see, we've now put the word hello into cell G1. A usable step. Obviously, we can just put add another step, hello world. Run that, and we can run that, and we now have this reusable step of changing a cell value. But this requires us to have quite a reasonable understanding of uh, all of the action steps that we have. Instead, let's create, uh, or instead, let's think of an application that's really good at holding lists of information. I think we know that application is called Excel. So let's see how we can use that. So I'm going to create a table. Uh, so I'm going to call my column action, and I want to call my table. Let's get a bit bigger on this. I'm going to call my table automation table. Right. So let's. So the action that we want to take is to change a cell value. And we want to do that on sheet one, on range G one. We want to. We want it to be the word hello. Then we want to take another action. And we want to take that to be world. So cell H one. Let's clear these out for now. So now we need a framework so that we can deal with um, we need a framework so that we can deal with uh, this uh, this table. So I'm going to take those out, and now let's build this this framework, so this master process that we can use. So first of all, I'm going to create my worksheet. Set WS as active sheet. Uh, set to this not as it's equal. And 
I've then got to reference my table, so TBL as list object. Set TBL equals WS dot list objects brackets, and I called it automation table. Next, we want to loop through each of those cells within inside that table. So I'll create a counter, dim i as long. So for i equals one to tbl dot list rows dot count. Right, so we now have a framework for looping through each of the uh, cells on this on this table. So let's extract each row item. So dim range value a string rng value equals ws dot list objects. Uh, no, tbl dot list columns is called action base body range first row first column right then we want to take our range so at the minute we're picking up we're looping through this range value is going to return this value here of change cell sheet one g1 hello so let's separate this down into uh, an array so dim and plus action array that's variant Action array equals the split of my range value. Here I've got, uh, I'm splitting it by uh, a line break. So that's character code 10. So I've now broken, so change cell value, sheet one, G1, and hello are now separate values included inside my array. Now have a select case. And it's for the action array of zero. And select the first case. So if my case equals change L value, in that case, I want to run a macro. That macro is called change cell value. And the arguments that I need to pass are so my first argument is my worksheet name which is what I've got here. My second argument is my range address, which is what I have here. And then the third argument is the value. So my first argument is just going to be called action array item zero. No, it's not. It's item one. Action array item two. Action array item three. Right, have I made any typos there? We'll soon find out. Let's come back over into Excel. Let's hide some grid lines and let's insert a shape as a button. Let's just format that. And then we'll assign a macro to that, which is run automation. So in theory, if I've not made any typos, when I click run me, what should happen is that it will go through this table. You'll select this first cell. You'll break that cell down into its component parts. And each of those will then run the change cell value macro, passing those arguments into this macro down here. After it's done that, it'll then move on to the second item in that table. So I'll click run. Let's see if I've made any typos. I haven't, that's good news. Uh, so it's now put the words, Hello and world right there. So hello world. Perfect. So that's a reasonably uh, simple action step. Now let's pick up another action step. Let's say we wanted to open up a another workbook. For example, well for that we could use uh, our uh, macro recorder. So I'm just going to run that. I'm just going to go file. Uh, no, I don't want blank workbook. Let me try that again. Macro recorder. OK. Go file, open. Let me browse to my 
pick my pick up my folder here. Example two. I'm going to open this file here. Statement automation Vancouver example. Click OK. Perfect. We'll then click stop uh, on that and then come and look at that piece of code. That's the first one. Where's my? Did I record it in there? I did. There we go. That's fine. So I'm going to copy that code and bring that into my framework here. So sub, open, I call it Excel, open workbook. For this, all I need is a file path. Do that and file name equals file path. So I now have the code that can handle that. Let's come back over into Excel. That's the workbook I don't need. I'm going to call this Excel Open Workbook. The only thing I need is the file name. So I'll paste that in there. I don't need the speech marks. Drag that over a bit so we can see that. OK, so we now have this step that's called Excel Open Workbook. So let's add this into our macro over here. OK, so if it's Excel Open Workbook, in that case, we want to run the Excel Open Workbook. It only has one argument. Open workbook, have we got the right words? It looks like it. So now I want to close this workbook over here. So when I click run me, it should put the words hello world in there and then have if we've then created this step that will open a new workbook. Click run. There we go. That's opened up that workbook and it has entered our text into those cells up there. Right, so what I've given you there is the framework as to how we can think about this as a master process, but then also these individual steps as to how we can apply them. So we're applying this Power Automate approach back into our VBA way of thinking. So. I'll just stop there to see if there's any other questions. Uh, I don't think there's any questions in the chat, but I'm going to throw you one on this one anyway, because, yep. uh, you know, th there are some comments in here that uh, that there's um, that they love the uh, sort of the structure and the, the framework kind of thing. Um, I'm a little curious to know on this one from from my own side, like do you, when you sit down, you're actually going to go and develop a macro on this. How often do you actually sit down and do this where you sit down and scope it out? And say, OK, this is what it's going to be. I'm going to go in and I'm going to write these or are you more of a I'm just going to start writing and see where it goes kind of thing and then look back at it and go, maybe I should have broken this down a little bit more along the way. What's your, your approach in anger in the real world? Uh, well, in if I flick back a few years, I would have just gone in anger and just written macros as they come. Uh, what I'm about to show you is the, the, uh, the outcome of what's possible when you think ahead. Uh, when you have decided that you're going to try and build this framework before you need it. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely in the past, I'd have, I would have gone at it from from the start without thinking about what the next steps were. And I suspect most people, most people do. But um, you you end up you find yourself writing the same pieces of code over and over again. Uh, you find yourself googling the same websites. Uh, sometimes my own over and over again to pick up those same uh, pieces of code that I wrote four or five years ago. Let me let me throw you one sort of additional wrinkle on this. Yep. I mean, I, I agree with you, and I, I think that like from a pro code stand, standpoint, like I mean, when you sit down and you break it down like that, I mean, I think that the process sort of you know building the process of first and coding it separate second is is a phenomenal thing. One part where I find personally where that sort of breaks down is when you end up getting into trying to code into an area that you've never coded into before, right? A new section of the object model or whatever else. Yep. Uh, same experiences there? 
Uh, well, so ultimately, you've, it's if you don't know what the if you don't know what the arguments are, or you don't know what the um, how that document object works, uh, then it becomes trickier. So it depends how deep that the document object model there in that part goes. For example, charts, uh, it's exceptionally deep, it's exceptionally complex. Uh, I would definitely, you would need to think about what modular things do you actually need uh, if I was going into that level of depth, because it's difficult to create that in a uh, in a true modular way. But you might view it as a, uh, I want to create a bullet chart, therefore I have a bullet chart um, of a bullet chart step. So that might involve several other steps. So it depends how you want to think about that and what you're likely to reuse. Because you could break it down as I want to create a chart, I want to add a series, I want to change my first series color to blue. And you'd end up with so many steps that it becomes too hard to manage. So you've got to try and think about what makes sense in terms of a, a what would be an entire step to undertake in one go would be my answer to that. Fair enough. I think we're uh, I think we're good on the questions. Right. So a few weeks ago, I got a question on uh, <clears throat> on Twitter from somebody. This is the question I got. So credit and collections department could really use a template for taking an aged accounts receivable report and generating template collection emails and attaching PDFs to the invoice, uh, PDFs of the invoices to the emails. How would you go about that? Well, the the truth is I already have my framework for how I would deal with this. Now, I've taken this uh, the spirit of this, I've changed it slightly in terms of the PDFs, uh, but there's no reason why we couldn't do it. And that's what we're going to move on to look at as a demo as to how could we answer this question. So how can we use this aged accounts receivable report and attach items to it and then send emails? Right, to do this, we're going to use this, um, this spreadsheet here. <clears throat> So what I have here is a uh, is a spreadsheet. Uh, it has a, uh, a slicer on it that lets us select different uh, customers and then displays what their outstanding invoices or credit notes are. All of this uh, data comes from uh, a query. Uh, I have no idea why that's come up because it was all so we've got a customer list of who all of our customers are. We've then got a, a file path back to our source, um, kind of aged accounts receivable worksheet. So all of this is being pulled in through a query. Let me just open up my original source data here. And you can see that. So we have this aged accounts receivable report as I said, that's being pulled in through Power Query. Uh, then we've just got some um, it's been pulled into these data tables. We have this customer list and then using a slicer that is connected to uh, this table. We can then slice that so that we can view specific customers uh, information. So that's how this this template currently works. So it's primarily built around Power Query extracting data from those files. Now, I have done some pre-work on this just to make it easier for us to manage. So we have this parameter here that's called current month. we we'll change that to February. You'll see that that then drives a few of these elements. So we have this report item here, and that is a named range that is um, the, that's the name range as to where we can find the file which Power Query is then referenced to. So I've dealt with all the form and the firewall issues on that. Uh, that's all been handled. By changing the date, we'll then change which file we're then picking up for our report. We have a uh, a cell function that's then just pulling out what the name of this worksheet is. We have a cell function that's telling us what the name of this current worksheet is. A cell function telling us what the name of this statement template is. Uh, we have this current index number. I'll come back to that in a second. We have this row count of the number of items that we have in our customer list. So if I unfilter this, uh, we currently have eight rows in that table and we have eight rows in that cell. And then from that table, we're picking up various elements depending on what 
index number we select. So if I select index number two, it's picking up the second row from there. If I select index number three, it's going to pick up the third item from there and so on and so on. So that picks up the name of that company, who the email should go to, uh, what the name is of the PDF that we want to create and that we, that we want to attach to the email. And then we have this, it's called if true. Uh, so all this is doing is checking whether uh, the index number that we're currently on is less than or equal to the number of rows that we have in our table. And you'll see why that's useful shortly. So from here, we're going to create, so this is the tool I have that I call the Automation Toolkit. I'm going to create a table. I'm going to call this Automation, automation Table. So this has four columns, include, description, action, and parameters. So the first thing we want to do uh, is that if our month num if our month changes, we want to update our query. So we want to refresh our query. So I'll come over here, come back to this add in, and I'll insert an action. So I've got this Power Query Optimize action. I'll add that. I'll add in this Excel Refresh Data action. Uh, and then we'll just start with those. So because these are just, it's all just text inside a cell, that means we can concatenate uh, any of these uh, text items to get the uh, parameters that we want to feed into our automation. So first of all, our file name is called that. Uh, do I want to have a background refresh? I want that as false. If I want this to run faster, I'll ignore privacy. Uh, the next item on that is then I want to refresh my query. So where is the workbook? Oh. So I want to, let's say I refresh all, therefore I don't need a sheet name and I don't need the pivot table name. Right, so in theory, we are, if I change that to the 28th of February, 2022, and I run that, Got, uh, so running 0.91 seconds. My statements are now set to February rather than January. So let's just change this back to January just so we can see that something actually happened. Select that and run. We go 0.66 seconds. We're now back to our January data inside our um, customer statement. Right, the next thing we want to do is to change our cell value. So here we're at cell number three. We want that to become uh, number one. So it always starts at the beginning. So I've got to change a cell value. Uh, the next thing I want to do is to change my slicer. So it picks the first item. So Excel change slicer. After that, I want to add a step that will then save my PDF of that item. And then uh, actually let's, remove that step, we'll do that one in a few seconds. So the first thing we want to do is to change a cell value. So again, we are using concatenated text here. So that's the file name that I want to use. What's the sheet name? Sheet is up here. I used a cell function for that. I did use a cell function. Yeah, 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 yeah. Try that again. So my file name is that one. My sheet name. Automation. My cell. What cell do I want to change? So I want to sell this. I want to change this cell here. So cell D9, I think it is. But just in case I add more rows, uh, I want to add a cell function onto that using the address of my current index. Close that. I want to change it always to one, so it's the first item. And then based on whatever item is selected in there, I want to change my slicer on this template so it always selects the first item. My file name is, 
you could use named ranges in here. There's nothing to stop you doing that uh, at all. My slicer name, if I come up here, select slicer, slicer settings is slicer underscore customer underscore name. And the item that I want to change it to is uh, whatever my company name is in there. So if I run this, what should happen is that this cell should become number one. Uh, which will flow through to these and then change my stem statement template to select alpha, which is the first item. So let me select that and then we'll run this process. Perfect. So our item selected is one and my statement template is now selected on alpha. Just save this workbook. OK, the next thing we want to do is to save a PDF. Uh, of this statement. So I can insert an action, Excel save PDF, add that, uh, and then we want to email that. So that's in my Outlook section. So we get used to selecting file names. And the reason of this is because we can then run this, uh, we can run automations on other worksheets. So if you can open up another worksheet, you can run uh, another automation on it. Now I want to save the PDF of the statement template. I've only got one sheet, so that's fine. Uh, and then my PDF, I want to save it under that file path there. Then I want to attach this and send that PDF as an email. So that is going to go to, I've got my email address up there. It doesn't need to BCC anybody. It doesn't need to CC anybody. My subject can be, uh, let's use a text function. So I can use my date. Uh, and let's say I want the month, 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 month. Yeah, 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 yeah. Close that. Um, And staff account. That's the monthly statement of account. Uh, the attachment that we want to put on this is the PDF that we created in the previous step. Now we know what that file name is because we created that PDF in the previous step and saved it there. And I'm going to put this as a display rather than a send because these are all fake email addresses. Uh, at least I hope they're fake email addresses. If not, someone will get a very strange uh, email in the morning. So let's click run and see what happens if I've got this right. Around 3.38 seconds. Uh, I have an email here to Alpha. It has the statement of account. It has this. Uh, statement of account, that PDF attached there. And also if I come to this file here, you can see that that statement of account has now been created. So that PDF didn't exist before and now it does. So we can create one. Let's now see if we can loop through and create a lot. So I want to insert another action on here and I want to change my cell value. So I hope I don't create an infinite loop. Actually, I can probably use, uh, I've got to change cell value step here. So let me copy that, put that over the text there. Now the, the value that I want is whatever that value is plus one brackets just to make sure it calculates first it should do but let's just make sure right then we need to add in this looping process now looping becomes uh, a bit trickier so we, after we've changed our initial cell value to one we want to insert a step up here so we've got this looping process so we create a flow reference 
I will um, insert that. So we've got a reference point that's called my reference. And then down here after my change cell value to insert an action there, use this flow item that's called if true go to. We'll add that and then let's just add another change cell value at the end so that we even after we finish looping it ends up at uh, it always ends up at one. So let me just copy that. Here. Right now, if true go to, this is a slightly tricky one. It's a slightly tricky one conceptually anyway. Uh, so my file name. You know what that is, we've selected that a lot of times. Uh, my sheet name. You know what that is as well. And then my cell reference. So which cell have I used to say whether something equals true? So cell address. And it's this item there. So on this worksheet, if or on this workbook, on the sheet automation, if cell D14, if that value is true, it's going to go back to my uh, reference step is how this should work. Right, just make sure I haven't got an infinite loop. So that does change before it then goes to the flow. I'll save this just in case it does go wrong and I've done something wrong. Let's click run and see what happens. Right, so it's now for looping through and creating those emails and attaching those PDFs one by one. Good, that's now finished. So 10.55 seconds, not too bad. And then if I come to my folder over here, you can see that we've created each one of these uh, PDFs and attached each one of those to those emails that you saw that were being created one by one. Now, the final step for this is obviously, so we'd save this, we'd come back, then a month later, we would get our February data, change our single parameter, uh, and then we would click run. Now, one of the things to notice is that the, the January date had eight uh, customers in it. Uh, the February data only has six customers in it, um, but it should be that our customer list will update and this number will change to six. So therefore it adjusts depending on the number of rows that we have within our data. So I'll click run on that. It's running through creating my February emails and attachments. Just done that 8.26 seconds. And there you can see that we have our February PDFs that have been created. And also, uh, if I select some of these emails, you can see that they have been created too. So that automation has now run. Uh, and we've now created this, uh, this action step, these action steps that are based upon this kind of Unix philosophy, which is kind of how Power Automate is also created. the uh, the demo uh, so I'll just kind of close this thing up now so when we come back to let's come back to the start and the start was what's the one thing you can do such that by doing it everything else will be easier or unnecessary and for me that answer is trying to automate as much of Excel as possible so in that example we still use Power Query that is a key part of that whole automation framework but that 20% either side, that's what this automation uh, framework is really good at doing because it enables us to manage those other steps that would be uh, that also soak up a lot of time. And all of this is built on a principle that was established in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, about how we can write programs that do one thing, that do it well, that work together, and that handle text streams. Now, I think in this, what I've the, the method that I've told you, I've shown you how to do it. I think I've given you the keys to the kingdom because through this, you can automate all of your own work. You can take all of those processes and you can build your own frameworks. 
Um, the example that I showed you at the start is exactly how that works. Now, I would say that I have a training program, as I said at the start, and this is a lot of the stuff that we cover within that training program. So if you want to find out more uh, and get hold of the tools that, uh, that I've developed and I've used, um, then you're welcome to join that training program. And until the 21st of April, there is a 20% uh, off that. But hopefully, this I didn't want this to be a sales pitch, but hopefully it's shown you what you can do with VBA when we apply that thinking from Power Automate and, X and Office Scripts into our development of VBA. Mark, can I interrupt you for a question? You can interrupt me because I've just finished. Fantastic. That's perfect timing then, isn't it? All right. So, uh, so a couple of questions in this, um, uh, specifically around the macros that you're actually using here. Yes. Um, where are they stored? Are they in an add-in that you built? Yes. So the, uh, the, if I open it up, so if we come to developer, Visual Basic, uh, we can see. Oh. So here I have this, um, it's in this add-in, I have this toolkit that's called Excel. So here's my here's my steps for how I open up an Excel workbook. Okay, so I have the file path. I have a step as to say whether it's I open it as read only, whether we update links, whether we open the, what file password password we want to use, whether we modify that password. So all of that exists within uh, it's a normal Excel VBA add-in. So if I wanted to use that step, just as an example, uh, insert action so Excel. Uh, it's probably open. Excel open. I'll add that. And you can see that we can select what file path where the file is, whether it's read only, update links, the file open password, the file modify password, and all of that is driven uh, through, uh, yeah, it's just straightforward uh, VBA. So all of that is an add in that exists. But there's nothing to stop somebody. Uh, you could take this code and then put it into your uh, another workbook uh, and then run this automation through, um, through just a, work, a button that exists on a specific workbook. Awesome. I think that uh, probably answers the uh, the question from the folks there. Uh, there's a comment on uh, from someone about uh, seeing this uh, technique being seriously useful for um, for distributing custom tools to business users, where one needs to tweak a few things for themselves and doesn't have the time or skill uh, to develop their own frameworks. Um, I I'm impressed, man. That's a that's a cool looking tool. I mean, you've obviously thought a lot about how all of this stuff goes together and how it's uh, it's very. Um, uh, pick and choose, I guess, and, and sort of follow through. It's a, a very clever approach to, to what we've got there. How would somebody buy this, Mark? Uh, I know you don't want to make this a sales pitch, but I'm going to make you make it a sales pitch right now. So how, how would somebody actually get their hands on this tool? At the moment, you the only place to get hold of this is inside my is inside the training program. It's uh, it's one of the tools that we use. Uh, there's there's various tools within this that help within the overall process. So. Uh, Within the training program, we teach about how um, we open this, uh, how we uh, manage our inputs. So there's a tool around uh, how we control inputs so that we can control file names. Because so, some of that piece around Power Query is that if we don't control our file names correctly, if we don't have uh, file naming conventions, then actually we're creating manual steps for ourselves. So if we can uh, save files in the correct place with the correct naming conventions, uh, then we can automate our input and we can get a start, we can get a beginning to end process. So that's also in my training program, along with uh, this Power Query, and there's some, some training about tables, what data is, how we manage data. Uh, I'm currently just working through the formulas piece at the minute. And then this end piece here is primarily what we've looked at uh, the senior. So it's, it's in my training program. There are people who are using it. It is being, um, I suppose, it's, it's quite a loose framework because ultimately it's just text in a cell, isn't it? Um, so it is quite a, uh, let, let's be honest, it is just text in a cell. Uh, so that's the that's the framework that I've, there are people who are working through it and using it in real life. And I want to get more and more real life examples of people using this so that we can build on it and, and create it into a tool that is, um, that is even more useful. At the minute it's based on uh, my experience of working in the real world and a few other people who have tried it out. So we're just trying to get some more uh, feedback on this to really uh, turn it into the best tool that it can be. Cool stuff. Can you uh, throw out the slide that has the link to your website again, just to make sure that... Uh, that's uh, yes. So um, 
So if you want to join my training program, it is there. It's at selfgrid.com forward slash academy. Uh, or if you want to contact me in any other way, my uh, summary slide there. So there's some other contact, Ooh. other contact detail there on the bottom left. So that's my email, uh, my contact form on my website, and then also my LinkedIn address so people can um, find me there. Fantastic. Um, yeah, it's cool. I I, uh, I I love the just like the sort of the, the power automated ishness of the uh, of the way that the approach that you've actually taken in there. I mean, that's very cool, and uh, I certainly uh, can see how that can actually bring the uh, the power of the. Uh, well, I guess it's taking you to the uh, to the low code solution, right? Or or hopefully even closer to the no code solution versus the pro code yeah, I mean, that we're used to building. Yeah, because the I mean the the premise is that once you've got this this automation framework, is that the is that somebody in your team uh, can run this run this process and literally they are just changing cells in a text it's something they understand so it is a vba equivalent of a of a no code uh, solution is the uh, is the plan i mean the truth is i so i first developed this in 2015 i think it was or maybe 2016 and then i parked it because i thought who's ever going to want to use this um and then, and then I saw Power Automate, and I'm like, oh, lots of people might want to use this. Uh, so it's taken me a while to then uh, bring it to a point where uh, I think it's ready for more people to to use it in anger. If it makes you feel any better, it took me ten years to get my ad and out to the uh, to the world. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's the way sometimes how it goes there. Um, awesome. Uh, are there any other questions uh, for Mark at all, or, or any questions that I haven't answered or, or brought through to him? Um, if uh, if there are, please uh, fire them into the chat or uh, throw up your hand, and you can come off uh, off mute and ask as well. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure Mark will be uh, happy to entertain questions by voice. Um, I'm I'm very happy to entertain any questions at all. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll throw it out there. Um, it, as we're uh, as we're waiting for uh, for stuff to come in here, Mark, I just want to say a big thanks for uh, for coming to put this together. Um, really interesting stuff. Cool uh, cool stuff, and really enjoyed it. That's uh, it, awesome work. Really well, I mean, ho hopefully it's, it's brought a different way for people to think about uh, VBA. And as I said, um, it wasn't intended to be a sales pitch, but to show people that actually with the right framework and a few s simple -ish steps that you can build something quite powerful that is exceptionally reusable. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and honestly, I mean, um, you know, when I look at this stuff, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to share links and, and put it out there to people because, I mean, I think that, you know, there's there's a lot of time for learning and a lot of people have different things out there. And, you know, what uh, what helps one person doesn't help others. What helps some, some helps tons. Right. And I, I think it's always good for, for people to be aware of that. So um, I, I just say I think it's so fascinating. I mean, how organized all the stuff is. I mean, I, I can certainly say when I code, I mean, there's there's times when I sit down and I break out, you know, and try and map out an entire framework and then I get into an area of the object model and go, geez, I got to throw all that away because it doesn't work like that, right? I mean, but, <laughs> you know, that's where you get into uh, into dealing with uh, very, very, um, I don't know, the specific things or, or whatnot. It's, yeah, it depends. A lot of refactoring. And, and, and there's a key element around when you're, um, when you when you automate something, you always want to start with a template or, or something that is bigger and then you reduce it down. So you, so if you've if you've got to send out you know three worksheets to somebody but four worksheets to somebody else, then create your template to have the four worksheets and take one out. Don't try and have the three and then add one. Always template at the highest level and then reduce down so that you're not creating in your automation. You're always taking away. Yeah, there you go. Interesting. There you go. Nice tip. Cool. Um, well, I don't see any other questions coming in, so. Um... So yeah, thanks again for coming, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to um, to stop the recording here, but I will get it uh, produced and up on our YouTube channel at Skillwave within the next 48 hours.